IT ticket to you, Diane. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, we are recording now. <clears throat> All right then, uh, good morning everybody. And uh, this is the Almoro County Police Department Citizens Advisory Committee <clears throat> meeting. Today is Tuesday, February 9th, 2021, and it is at 9 a.m. Uh, of course, we have a housekeeping issue. I need to read the protocol for, with respect to the COVID-19 requirement. So I'll go ahead with that now at this time. Uh, this meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with ordinance number 20-A14, an ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 pandemic. The members who are electronically present at this time are, and when I state your name, um, please uh, say present. Um, Brian Williams, is he here yet? Not yet. Uh, Brent Hall. Uh, I'm promoting them in now. Right, let me hold off then for a moment uh, so that the, uh, they can acknowledge. Uh, uh, Hi. Uh, Hi, Brent. Is that you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Very good. And is Brian on his way? He should be. I don't see Brian. Let's see. All right. Well, um, and uh, all right. Let me read through who's here then uh, at this point, and others I'm sure will join. Brent Hall, please say present. Present. Uh, Diantha McNeil. Present. Uh, John Spriggett. Present. And Olga is not, and Richard Hewitt is present. We do have a quorum. We're just waiting on Olga to come in, and as well as, uh, of course, Brian. All righty. Now that the housekeeping issue is uh, completed and we do have a quorum, um, <clears throat> I'd like the approval of the minutes uh, for uh, uh, December's, uh, pardon me, for last session in December. Do we have approval of the minutes? So moved. Do we, have a, do we have a second? I second. Okay, very good. Um, and then of course we come to the section now, uh, which is matters before the public. Uh, and uh, Ron, do we have any matters between last meeting and this meeting that were brought before the public with respect to comments, suggestions, complaints, etc.? Good morning, Richard. Thank you. The only uh, comment I received was actually a request we had a citizen wanted to be, know how to find where the Ask the Chief at Abmarl.org was located. So uh, we were able to take care of that request. We also made sure that it was within the uh, CAC site and we also direct them to the Abmarl County Police website where it says contact us. So we were able to get that information out to them. And that's the only request I've had related to CAC matters since the last meeting. And is that the best way? And what's the e what's the best email to for the public to communicate with to be able to uh, make a suggestion or or a concern? Yeah, the best uh, email is uh, ask the chief at abmoral.org. Um, that goes to me and several of my staff members, so we make sure that we're on it, and we'll be able to reply in a timely manner. So that's the best site. All right. So when somebody does from the public, our neighbors, our friends, when they. Uh, send an email to that site. Do you actually see it yourself as well? I do. I get every, every one of those in my inbox as well. Okay. Well, that's great. It looks like our uh, friend Brian has joined us. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. All right. So let's uh, take a note that Brian has joined the meeting as well. And the only one left would be Olga. And she's already indicated she's running a little bit late. So I'd like to take a moment and welcome our visiting supervisor, who is from the uh, Scottsville District, and that's Donna Price. Welcome, Donna. Good morning. Thank you, Richard. It's an honor and privilege to be here. That's great. All right. And of course, we'd like to welcome uh, <clears throat> Deputy Chief Sean Reeves. Sean will be doing a presentation today, with, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but welcome, Sean. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. All righty then. Uh, and we've already uh, we've already approved the minutes, um, and uh, 
<clears throat> the matters before the public are completed. Ron, this, at this point, I'd like you to opine a little bit on uh, the hiring and the staffing and the overall morale of the uh, police department. We like to check in on this every few meetings. Uh, I know these are challenging times with COVID, et cetera. What can you tell us about the hiring and staffing and the morale? Oh, well, thank you, Richard. Yeah, it's been a, a couple of meetings since I've had a chance to update this group. And I just want to thank everybody for coming on this morning. I know uh, everybody's busy this time of the year with these uh, meetings that we're doing with the Zoom and the team. So thank you for taking the time to come on this morning. I think we're going to have a great meeting, with some good topics. And I think Sean's got a very good presentation that will generate some questions. I like to keep uh, the CAC informed of what we're looking at, uh, staffing, recruiting, and retention wise um, when I get the opportunity. So asked me for this meeting to do a little uh, update where we're at. As everybody's probably aware, our numbers have uh, gone down as far as um, recruits potentially coming out and taking the test that we normally would have. I actually pulled some numbers back to 2017 just for applications alone. Uh, in 2017, we had 229 applications, which is a good year. In 2000, 2020, we only had 125 applications. So that's a drastic uh, decrease of over 100 applications. We'll just take that a step further. That's just the application. That's not getting you through the door to take the test. That's that's where we weed a few people out, and then we get them to come in and take an interview, and then we do a written test, and then we do the physical agility in one day. So we normally we used to have 100 people that would show up for our testing day. We do that two times a year. And now we're looking at maybe having 15 to 25 people show up for our testing day. So our, our numbers, and this is not an anomaly here in Albemarle County. I'm talking to my peers across the state, over in the Valley, um, associated with the Academy, 59 other departments, police and sheriffs. They're experiencing the same uh, issue that we're experiencing here with recruiting numbers going down, less people looking to get into law enforcement as their career. Um, we're hopeful that that'll swing eventually. Currently, right now, as I sit here and talk with you, my authorized staffing is 152 for Albemarle County, and that's counting three uh, animal protection officers because they're sworn. We have to count them towards our sworn staffing. And animal protection, their primary role is to just that, be animal protection officers. Um, that's their primary role. Law enforcement is not their primary. It's their secondary. But we count those towards our staffing at 152, which is what I'm authorized right now sitting at and it could be worse we're currently sitting at 147 so we have five vacancies um, that we're working on filling um, currently and one of the things that I look at and I know I've told this group members of this group before is I look for folks that are already certified it saves us money in hiring and training um, they have to meet the standards that we set forth and a lot of times they don't um, so we're finding ourselves weeding through quite a few applicants that are already certified in the state being they've already been police officers somewhere in the state and we're able to um, bring them in. We've had some success. I will tell you one quick story that hasn't happened in my over eight years here. The academy that started in July, um, excuse me, the academy started in January. The first two days, two of the four people we sent over there said, this is not for me and they went home. Um, we've never had that happen before. We've had one every once in a while, but to have two leave um, that you've invested all that time, energy, and money into um, in the first two days is difficult, but it's better that it happened on the front end and that they didn't go through the whole academy through field training and hit the street. That would be a whole lot. That's another story. So I always tell people, I commend people that realize, you know what, I got here. It's not for me. I'm, I'm bowing out and that's okay. Um, but that just makes our job a little bit more difficult. We roll our sleeves up and we recruit a little bit more. Um, a little bit more in depth. Before I roll into the morale part, does anybody have any questions for me regarding uh, the uh, Richard, if you want to? Yeah, so what is, uh, first of all, what's the ratio at 147 slash 142 per thousand? And what is the uh, mean throw across the state? Could you repeat that again, Richard? You broke out a little bit on my end. <laughs> okay, so what is the ratio per thousand? Mm -hmm. uh, I know that there's a standard. What is the current ratio per thousand in Almaro County officers to per thousand population? Uh, last time I checked, we were up to about 1.38 officers, which is actually great compared to where we were. Um, the board's helped a lot with that. I know Diane has been involved heavily with that. She's really familiar with those numbers and the ratio. 
the state average that they asked, uh, that's, I guess the state standard is uh, over 1.5 in our comprehensive plan. Now, Mark County's goal is to get to 1.5 officers per thousand population. So we're slowly getting there, Richard. I know the, the COVID us back last summer, we were supposed to get two additional positions in uh, due to budgeting that we had to freeze uh, those. and We weren't able to fill those positions. Okay, uh, we're gonna pause for a moment here. Brent, do you have any questions <coughs> Uh, for the chief at this point uh, as to what he's covered so far. No. All right. Uh, Brian, do you have any questions for the chief? Yeah. Do you anticipate what took place on January 6th to have an impact uh, in terms of recruitment, um, retention of officers? That's a great question, Brian. I think, I think a combination of January 6th and everything that's happened in 2020 absolutely um, impacts the number of people that will come out and take the test that want to get in law enforcement, people stepped back and looked and said, wow, you know, you've seen the national news. Everybody here's watched it for the last year. And that's kind of really put, a, in my opinion, I think that's what's causing people to hesitate to come into law enforcement. But I believe that will have some impact. Yes. Um, folks that, you know, like the, my two deputy chiefs and I that are on the screen, it was a calling from the time we were in high school. We knew we were going to be it just stopping us from applying you know and there are those folks that are still out there so those are the ones that we're looking for um, want to serve their community and give back and that's what we're looking for right uh, john do you have any uh questions for the chief at this point uh, uh, yes um uh, uh, chief uh, do i understand that there are two uh, officers to be in the academy at the present time that are you're looking you have in there now that's correct. So uh, how does that stack up relative what your expected attrition is going to be in terms of retirements? Well, you're getting ahead of me, John. I was rolling the morale next, but that's a great question. Um, <laughs> okay. Our attrition rate uh, has been much higher this year. We normally average attrition rate of three to five a year is normal attrition. And uh, we're experiencing higher numbers than that this past year. And that's not all just people leaving law enforcement. People are getting into the age in the next year and a half, you're going to see a lot of folks from ACPD retire. Um, it's, they've reached their retirement age and, and good for them. You know, they've served the community and done their time and, and they're moving on to their next thing. But realistically, a goal for us to have an academy is three to five recruits to match it. Um, but I, we're playing catch up now being down five. So that number's even higher. Hope that answered your question, John. Well, you, you did. I, I guess I would wonder if looking at the projections, where do you think that would leave us at, uh, say, the summertime? You know, what would be the uh, the bogey that we really be trying to identify uh, and, and 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 bring on board? Yeah. So July, we, the academy runs twice a year. It's once in January when it starts, and once in July when it starts. So our goal would probably be to have at least six in the academy for July. Meanwhile, we're, we've got a pipeline of folks that we're, we've got in the pipeline now. For those five vacant positions I was discussing earlier. Okay. So our goal is we have several of those that are certified. So we're hoping to be able to bring them on board and bring that down. The goal would be by July to be back to full staffing um, based on our hiring efforts. Now you got to remember when we hire somebody, they're counting towards my 152, but they might be in the academy um, and, they're, and they're not they're not productive for a year because it takes a year for the academy and all the training that they go through. So uh, my hope is by this summer, um, Probably last year, uh, maybe eight months ago, nine months ago, we were at full staffing for a day. <laughs> How it happens, you know, somebody retires and, you know, somebody finds a job out of law enforcement. And that's normal. That's normal in law enforcement. But the goal would be by this summer, John, to be able to be full staff. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Diantha, do you have any questions for the chief up to this point? I just have a quick question and Ron, it, maybe you're not gonna actually be able to answer it today, but I know at one point we had a ratio of 1.2 mm -hmm. per thousand, which was fine when we were very, <laughs> when we weren't as urbanized, we are urbanized now. And I heard you say 1.38 and your goal is to, to look at something around 1.5. I guess my question only is, when is the last time, are you aware that Alamar County has actually looked at or studied what the appropriate ratio might be <laughs> uh, over the last several years. It seems like that's something that should be perhaps 
benchmarked or at least studied. Um, I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to keep belaboring it, but it's just something to think about. Yeah, that's that our county now than we were a decade, decade and a half, decade and a half ago with our growth, right. our population growth. Absolutely. That's a great question, Diana. Actually, we, we did that evaluation. That's how we came to the 1.5 number. Oh, great. See, I didn't um, realize that. That's good. Yeah, that's, so that's in the, that's in our comprehensive plan it is to come to that 1.5 number because now that great point, because five years from while we're striving to get to that 1.5, our population increased 10 to 15,000. So those are things that we need to continually. It's one of those things where you can't be one and done when you look at it. To your, yeah. As you know, you got to keep looking at it every couple of years to make sure that we're keeping up with the population. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, great. That, we did. We did come up with that number that way. Somehow or another, I must have missed the one point five, and I apologize for that. But that's good oh, to know. Not at all. Absolutely. Righty, uh, Donna. Do you have any questions for the chief at this point? Now, I think probably just following up with the conversation that Chief Lance and Supervisor McKeel had, <laughs> that 1.5, is that um, apportioned as you differentiate between very rural areas versus urban areas? I would imagine in the cities, for example, the ratio would be higher than perhaps out in a, a very rural area. And I, I think that may be what Diantha was, was kind of the undercurrent, <clears throat> excuse me, of what she was asking. Um, and as you mentioned just then, Chief, you know, this was what five years ago that the 1.5 was figured our population has gone up. So should our target be a higher than 1.5? Yeah, that's some, a great, great question. Thank you for that, Diane. That's something that we need to evaluate this year um, in, in the police department to determine whether that 1.5 is still a valid number. I will say, um, you know, because I study this a lot, the city, for example, you mentioned city policing, for example. They're, they're at one point they were over two. Yeah, they were over two. Mm -hmm. um, they, now they've lost some rank and file over over the last year or two, but they were definitely over two. Their population, the last time I checked, was forty some thousand versus our hundred and almost ten thousand. So yeah, yeah, I think yeah, in, a, in a perfect world, perfect world. This is me. You know, I, I get everything I want. Kind of world we would be or higher, um, honestly, uh, for our yeah, because. Yeah, they're at 48,000, and in the last 50 years, their population increased 15.3%, whereas ours has increased 175%. Mm -hmm. A lot of what you're talking about is very reminiscent of when I was a personnel officer in the Navy for a couple of years in terms of, you know, in strength. And, um, and I really would say, I think we have to question the advisability of counting your officers in the academy against your in strength. I think we should be looking at um, putting those in a subset, a subcategory, because it's actual, you know, to coin the army phrase, boots on the ground, that really counts. Um, and so, you know, trainees, people who may be on disability, um, I, I would suggest that we look at factoring in an additional category for personnel counting for those numbers, because they're not actually performing the duties that we need them to do. That's a great point. And just to piggyback, and I'm sorry to interrupt on Donna, I would look at the, the animal protection officers in a little different category as well. I mean, I don't, don't, know you don't want to get into a lot of categories, but to be honest with you, they are, they are very sep their work is very separate. Absolutely. So. Yeah, so ultimately what winds up happening is obviously the reason why the ratio question is important is because as the community grows, the ratio grows, and of course, Ron is on top of then adding with respect to the ratio. The reason why it's an important question for the supervisors is they're the ones that, uh, of course, vote on the budget. So that's why uh, they have specific interest with respect to this. But <clears throat> one of the factors that um, is a challenge for Ron as, as time goes by is the personality of the county starts to change a little bit. That means that as we become certain areas of more urbanized, those areas require a higher ratio. So um, that's why sometimes these things move from 1.5 in uh, personalities like Albemarle County to 2.0 in personalities like the city of Charlottesville. So, so, that's, so that's something he's cognizant of and working on as time goes on. Ron, you want to continue with uh, your presence? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Donna, did you have something to follow up with? 
Yeah, Mr. Hewitt, thank you. You know, that actually um, is, is a really important point. And I appreciate you mentioning that. We just had our annual report provided to us by Mr. Richardson um, on the number of responses that each department was involved in. And the number of responses by the Albemarle County Police Department was just almost astronomical. Um, so I, I can tell you right now what I'm taking away from this meeting as we go into the budget, as you know, Mr. Hewitt, you just mentioned, is um, I think we need to start looking at funding some additional positions in the Albemarle County Police Department. I mean, that, that's my takeaway at this moment. Thank you, and thank you for letting me add that. Ron, why don't you proceed with your um, your presentation? Absolutely. So I'll be brief on this last part. But I want to lot show him some uh, plenty of time for his presentation because I think it's going to generate a lot of questions. I'm excited about it. But uh, one of the last points I wanted to hit on, I was asked to talk about morale uh, up to this point over the last year. And I kind of uh, touched on it a few minutes ago for, when Brian asked me that great question. You know, morale is low. It's, it's low in law enforcement, not just Albemarle County. Um, I think it has a lot to do with you're seeing more retirements. Um, can retire they're saying you know why not it's a good time to go out uh, but the good news is oh you know over covid over all the things that we've been involved in and i could spend an hour just talking about all the things this police department's had to do and and you know the, one of our favorite new words is pivot but we've had to pivot to you know statue removal to election day to inauguration day all the things your police department had to plan for and prepare for leave was canceled during the year five or six different times. So that eventually will take a toll on morale. One of the things I want to say, because it's not all doom and gloom. One of the things I want to say is we have an incredible community here that supports the department. We have a community here that literally provides food all the time for the officers up front because they just feel compelled to do so. They're not asked to do so. I have a wonderful foundation that feeds the officers during COVID, during the election, during statue removal, all those things. So we, we've got a lot of folks that actually step up and support the department. And that really helps with the morale piece. And, you know, I, I'll tell you, and you guys probably know this from your experience, most officers don't want to be singled out. To say, hey, you're doing great. No, they just, they just want to have a sense that they're appreciated for what they do. And for me as well, down to the rank and file, we don't, we don't want to be singled out as you're doing a great job. You know, every once in a while, just that they know they're appreciated. And I've come to learn that we actually had a morale meeting not that long ago. And one of the biggest things was they want to feel the sense of appreciation um, that people um, feel what they're doing is, you know, good for the community type of thing. So I'm doing everything I can with my foundation. We're coming up with different ideas. Um, you know, we actually had a pop up food truck one day in the back lot. I know it sounds simple, but that boosted morale for that day. Officers were able to come out and, you know, when they got a roll call and they were able to get a quick meal without having to go into, uh, to a restaurant with COVID restrictions being what they are. So that's one of the things, Richard, that I keep my eye on, um, you know, with morale is making sure that we're keeping the people here so we can retain the people here. And I will leave you with this thought. One of the best things that we've ever done as a police department, thanks to Diantha and everybody involved, public safety pay scale has really helped me retain people here and help me keep morale elevated higher than it would have been if we were still in the world of compression. I think I would have lost a lot more people during this time if it wasn't for that. So thank you for that. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to catch everybody up on what's going on. All right then. Well, uh, Diane uh, uh, and I uh, worked quite a bit on that pay scale. Didn't we? That was a several year uh, venture. All right. Well, again, welcome Deputy Chief Sean Reeves. And Sean, can you talk to us a little bit about, and uh, we've asked you to do a presentation on, uh, really police reform and public policing and mental health, how it integrates. And uh, a number of uh, topics for you to touch upon are, when, when is it, <clears throat> when is support most needed? Uh, does all the, do all the patrol uh, get some of this kind of training? Uh, do some of the officers specialize more than others in training? Uh, our schools, of course, are paramount to us. Uh, the SROs should the uh, county bo uh, school board uh, choose to continue on. Will those SROs be provided with the mental health training that's needed, particularly with our young people in, in schools? And uh, what might the county expect in some of the costs associated with this training? So I'll let you do your presentation, but those are some of the topics 
we'd like you to touch upon. And then at certain points, we'd like to have you pause uh, and uh, we'll go around and uh, ask the members to uh, if they have any questions for you. So with that, uh, thank you and welcome. Absolutely, thank you, Richard. Uh, bear with me one moment while I bring up the uh, presentation. All right, um, can everybody see the presentation on their screen? Outstanding. Uh, first, uh, again, thank you all for the invitation. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Sean Reeves. Um, I've been in law enforcement for about 25 years now. Uh, 20 of those years have been with the Almar County Police Department, and I am uh, fortunate to, to work with such fine men and women of the Almar County Police Department, uh, especially Chief Lance, who uh, promoted me uh, this past September to the deputy chief of police position. Uh, upon being promoted, one of the first um, uh, priorities I had was to meet with all the squads uh, under my command of our operations section and hear what's on the mind of our officers, our line level patrol officers. And uh, mental health and law enforcement response, what surprising to me was one of the top three concerns um, on the minds of our officers, just the amount of time that they're spending on handling mental health crisis calls. And because that was a repeat, uh, repeat topic, that prompted me to reach out to community members um, and other professionals to see how they're in other departments within our organization to see how um, their professions intersect with the topic of mental health. And what we came away from this meeting was we're all seeing the same problems and all seeing the same concerns, um, which allowed us the opportunity to unify and point in a singular direction to try to tackle this very complicated issue. So as I proceed through this presentation, uh, I will stop after each slide to, to answer uh, any questions that you all might have. Um, uh, Sean, it might be uh, better if we stop closer to half through because I'm concerned about time. And okay. Unless, unless you think there's enough uh, uh, time, but maybe we'll go through a number of slides and then uh, uh, stop and pause and go around and ask questions. Uh, uh, that way we won't run out of time. Go ahead. Yeah, a absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it up to your, your discretion. If you have questions, then feel free to chime in. If not, we'll go ahead and roll through. So just want to give everybody a brief overview of, of mental health. So we're all on the same sheet of music when we tar start talking about this topic. And this is pulled from uh, the CDC website. And um, it Mental health includes our, our emotional, psychological, and social well beings. It affects us on so many different ways the way we think, we feel, and how we act. And it also uh, helps determine how we handle stress and relate to others and how we make healthy choices. And it impacts us from childhood, uh, adolescence, through adulthood. About one in five American adults and one in five children will experience a mental health illness at some point in their lives. Uh, which was alarming was that suicide is the second leading cause of death among people between 15 and 34 in the United States. And later on, I do have some stats on what we're seeing as far as suicide rates in our, in our community. Um, mental health uh, can be treated and, uh, you know, there, there are certain types of mental health that get better and patients recover and people who suffer from mental illness actually do recover with proper treatment. And we'll talk about what proper treatment looks like and what it does not look like in this presentation. And um, in there's the stigma that the vast majority of people with mental illness uh, that, that are violent and whether it's portrayed through movies, social media, et cetera. Uh, and that's just not the case. Um, they're, they're no more likely to be violent than anybody else. And as you see uh, on this slide, this is a mental health call for service. Uh, it's a three-year comparison from 2018 uh, through 2020 on how many calls for service, mental health calls for service by month um, that our officers respond to. And based on these numbers, uh, there's been a 1% increase over the past three years in mental health calls for service, as well as um, this past year, these mental health calls for service taking up nearly 3% uh, or comprising of 3% of all calls for service that our officers respond to, they're generated by the public. Um, and as you can see here, here's a three-year chart locally. This is just Albemarle County on how many suicides um, that 
uh, our officers responded to and investigated uh, this past year. This past year, as you can see, uh, we responded to 19 different suicides. Um, and that's uh, up significantly compared to where we were back in 2018. And um, uh, just to also uh, put this into context as well, how much time our officers are spending. Uh, for the month of December, uh, our officers spent over 139 hours uh, just handling mental health calls for service. Um, and this also includes uh, calls when we have people in custody. And I'll talk you through the process of what it looks like when, when we interact with people that are suffering from mental health illnesses, that um, we transport them to UVA hospital and then we'll have to sit with them. Uh, this past weekend, we've sat with the juvenile for three days. That's three full days we've had officers posted on a juvenile. And this is not the first time that that's happened. There's been at least a handful of incidents over the past two months or, uh, where we've spent 24, 48, 72 hours with a person in police custody at the hospital um, until we can locate services for uh, an individual uh, suffering from mental health. Here's additional context for you. Uh, those of you that have been around for a while are familiar with this map. This is sector. This is our current existing sector breakdown for Albemarle County. Uh, we have eight different sectors um, and there's an officer posted in each sector. Sometimes we have extra officers working um, as far as union or overall coverage officers. But when you start tying up one and two officers on mental health calls for service, or like this past weekend, we had three simultaneous, you're pulling three people off of the street um, in a county the size uh, or an area, a geographic area the size of Almoral County and tying them up for extended period of time. We're having to call people um, out early, hold people over and uh, frankly reach out to officers to come in and backfill um, because of these calls for service are taking up so much time. Uh, Richard alluded to the training our officers received. Out of 152 uh, uh, positions that we have, 124 of our officers are crisis intervention trained. That's CIT trained. Um, that's specialized week-long training that our officers attend um, that focuses on how to interact with people undergoing mental health um, uh, mental health crisis. And um, it is an impressive number. Uh, our agency is, is proud of this number. Obviously, our goal is to get to 152. Um, but we are proud of this number and our officers actually, the, the complete CIT training were a pin on their uniform to indicate that they are CIT trained. So that way when they're uh, interacting with people that are in a growing crisis or people familiar with CIT, um, they recognize this pin. Um, hand in hand with that is constitutional law training because there, there are some complexities when interacting in, you know, with, with people undergoing um, any type of crisis. And uh, that's just complementary. The constitutional complements the uh, crisis intervention training. Uh, any questions so far? Yes. Can you interject for a moment um, the time frame when somebody, if I'm a police officer and I'm one of the 124, how long of a period is that in terms of training? Hours, days? Uh, uh, the, the, yeah, great question. Uh, the CIT training is a week long program and it's open to any officer who. Um, who completes their field training uh, program. Uh, we look for a voluntary list to see uh, who is interested uh, as far as seniority, who, who didn't make the last classes or who's been on a waiting list and we'll filter down through who has not attended uh, crisis intervention or CIT training and get them signed up. But that is a week long training. Um, our numbers have uh, stagnated just slightly because of COVID and training opportunities associated with COVID, but um, they're looking at reopening CIT training and uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, uh, pushing officers through this uh, to get them certified. Now, uh, there's a full disclaimer that CIT, while it's a tool, it is a tool for our officers to learn how to effectively communicate with people under crisis. Um, it, it's not the end all be all. It's just like any other, it's just like any other tool. Uh, there's a time and place for it. And um, it's just extra training to, to give our officers a different perspective on people who are undergoing mental crisis and how to deal with them. And would you say you're about a quarter of the way through your presentation or half? Or? Um, I would say probably uh, a quarter. Are we doing okay on time? Yeah, we're fine. Uh, I'd like to go around the room then and ask uh, the members if they have any questions of you. Uh, so Brent, at this call, uh, point, uh, Brent, do you have any questions for uh, Deputy Chief? Yes, so who performs the training? Is that internal? 
or is there? No, uh, there, there's a Jefferson area uh, crisis intervention training team. Uh, that's part of a national program. Uh, we have instructors that actually go across the country um, as well as a lead instructor that actually teaches crisis intervention training on an international level. Um, the, the primary instructor is uh, based out of Region 10 office. So no, it's, it's not, they, they are not associated with law enforcement. However, they do train law enforcement. They also have trained fire rescue and other personnel um, on how to respond to, um, uh, to people with crisis. Okay, very good. Brian, do you have the uh, deputy chief? I don't have a question at this point in time, but by the end of his uh, presentation, I'm sure I will. All right. Uh, John, how about you at this point? Uh, no questions at this time. All right. Uh, and I've already asked mine. Uh, Diantha, do you have anything for the chief at this point? I don't have anything right now. I hope we're going to get to um, a discussion perhaps about looking at a mental health team that might include um, police officers, but and folks that are um, specifically trained in dealing with mental health issues. So that may be coming a little bit later in this presentation. All right. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And Donna, do you have anything uh, for the chief at this point? Not right now. Thank you. All right, uh, Deputy, uh, pardon me, Deputy Chief. Uh, Deputy Chief, go ahead and uh, continue on then. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, and this, this goes to, um, to Ms. McKeel's point about uh, an overview of our current process. And the reason why I picked this illustration is because um, this, is, this is what it feels like for law enforcement when we get um, tasked with having to deal with mental health. And we talk about the, the, the current state of, of our mental health industry or across the nation. And we are not coming up with productive solutions. We are just um, sticking our fingers in the hole and hoping the dam doesn't break. So uh, I'm gonna lead off with uh, this study that was conducted about imprisoning Americans mentally ill. And there's some data in this, uh, in these bullet points that's uh, pretty alarming if you haven't been privy to this information before. So according to the BJS, that's Bureau of Justice Statistics, um, there's about 14% of prisoners in state and federal facilities meet the criteria for having serious mental health conditions. That's just not mental health, that's serious mental health conditions that would otherwise have them institutionalized. And in local jails, the number was 26%. Only 5% of the general population meets these criteria according to the BJS. Mental illness also affects higher percentage of female prisoners than males. According to federal data, 40% of prisoners were diagnosed with mental health disorders between 2011 and 2014. Every year, 2 million people with psychological problems are jailed based on estimates by the National Alliance on Mental Illness. A 2016 report by the Treatment Advocacy Center found that mentally ill persons stay locked up longer, cost more to house, and are more likely to commit suicide and be placed in solitary confinement. The costs of incarcerating the mentally ill are significant. In Michigan, where mental illness affects a quarter of the state's 41,000 prisoners, it costs about $95,000 a year to house each one compared to $35,000 for prisoners without mental health problems. For the mentally ill who are not incarcerated, the state spends just $6,000 each year on average. So the takeaway from this, this particular study was instead of the, um, the state-run hospitals and institutional facilities that, that we've had in the past, historically, um, jails have now been the, the de facto um, housing for people suffering with mental illness. And one of the reasons why this is, is because of the relationship between law enforcement and how the responsibility, the enormous responsibility of handling and addressing people and responding to people undergoing some sort of mental illness has been um, laid at the feet of law enforcement. And we are not the ones, we are not doctors, we're not clinicians, and we are not the subject matter experts. We are not the ones who should be, in my opinion, should be the, the lead when it comes to um, handling people who are going to go mental crisis. So this is a byproduct of that. When you, when you task uh, law enforcement with this, there's only so many ways law enforcement responds to situations. And one of the primary ways is through incarceration. And um, my argument is that there's, there's got to be a better way, there's got to be a, a better solution than this, than housing people within our current jail system undergoing mental health crisis. So this is from the National Alliance of Mental Illness. 
Uh, this is a conference from 2020, and one of my counterparts for the teaches CIT uh, actually loaned me several of these slides. And this is on a national level. This isn't an exclusive to Almar County or the Commonwealth of Virginia. This is uh, with a few minor uh, deviations. This is traditionally how law enforcement responds to mental health crisis. So the police are the untrained mental health workforce in this country. And uh, typically, uh, law enforcement tends to escalate situations, not intentionally, but you're, you're dealing with somebody that's a mental crisis and they're, they're undergoing what's essentially a, a mental health, a medical uh, issue. And now you're introducing men and women with badges and guns uh, and uniforms to try to calm a situation down. And then when we take people into custody for treatment, typically that involves handcuffs. So now we're, we're in a situation where we're potentially escalating. Uh, through CIT, we're typically talk, we, we're trained how to talk to people, de-escalate situations, um, but, but oftentimes we have to transport people to the hospital in the back of a police cruiser as opposed to an ambulance. Um, other ways that, that people uh, uh, under crisis attend, uh, seek help is through individuals. Uh, they they self-commit to the hospital, um, emergency department, and that's where law enforcement takes people under crisis. We take them to the UVA hospital or, or Martha Jefferson. We're, we are bogging down our emergency services at the hospital for people undergoing some sort of mental crisis. Uh, friends, families, uh, and, and walk-ins. Um, they can get referred by the primary care or through social services in some areas. Our social services, we do not have. Almar County does not have a health and human services branch uh, uh, currently that, that will help out with this. Um, crisis call lines, we do not have a state crisis call line. I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Later on, we go into the Marcus Alert, and then uh, we don't have mobile outreach. That's something else that's in the works with the Marcus Alert system that the governor passed back in 2020. So uh, the last two arrows, we do not have. And then after you know somebody who's been triaged or received uh, some sort of services, uh, these acute services are for extreme cases only. Um, you know, Sometimes people are released back into care of others, loved ones, um, due to a variety of reasons. And uh, as we talked about earlier with the waiting periods, there's sometimes um, extended waits for beds to open up so that way we can send people to a, a facility. And we are, Almar County Police Department is fortunate to have a partnership with the Sheriff's Department who helps transport uh, patients in need of um, temporary detention across the Commonwealth for services or that would tie up our resources even longer. Um, and then, you know, you start dealing with what happens when services are declined, when people are referred back to, you know, community or natural support, or there's no therapeutic support, or they're incarcerated. Um, that feeds into homelessness, social isolation, social isolation, unemployment, suicide, and increased mental trauma. So we're not, we're not treating the problem. We're just feeding it into a system that, that perpetually spits out the problem. And um, as you see by, by our calls for service and the incarceration rates and the suicide rates, um, this is a significant issue. We talked about state facilities. Uh, there's been some, um, a few tweaks to this, this slide on the, on the um, Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Services. Uh, right now, you know, those green dots are training centers. Um, a lot of those have closed down. There's only one training center in the Commonwealth. That's one in the Southwest Virginia but there's nine facilities. There's eight behavioral facilities for adults and only one for children and adolescents um, and a center for behavior rehabilitation in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And several of these facilities are operating at limited capacity due to COVID-19 restrictions. So now, now with COVID, we pre-COVID, we were dealing with bed space. Now with COVID, um, with some hospitals operating at 50% bed space or having outbreaks or what have you, um, our sheriff's departments, our police officers that are sitting with patients at, at the hospital for extended period of times are waiting for a bed to open up and the sheriff's department will come and pick them up and take them all over the Commonwealth for wherever the first bed space uh, is available. So this is, um, so it's 945, Richard. Um, I can stop on this before we transition it over unless there's no questions. Um, into the next part. Where are, you in, where are you in the process? Are you about halfway through? Um, more, a little bit more than halfway through. All right, let's continue on because okay. um, we only have 15 minutes. All right, excellent. And this will go into um, Supervisor McKeel's question. So uh, what I, when I talked about earlier on um, uh, about reaching out to our partners, 
um, our regional partners back in uh, October after listening to feedback from the officers and really trying to wrap my head around um, what this what the situation is and just the timing and everything. I think the stars aligned. And in the quotation marks at the top, you know, I coined this phrase, um, decriminalizing medical calls for service, because that's at the end of the day, these mental health calls are, are essentially medical calls for service. Um, very few, if any, um, you know, when somebody picks up the uh, phone and dials 911 because they, they're undergoing some sort of medical issue, um, you know, they don't expect the police department to show up and be the, 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 the first responder. So I pose the question, why are, mental, why are mental health calls any different than those other? It's a medical call for service. And so we are, we are removing the stigma that there's something wrong, something illegal with mental health when somebody's undergoing that crisis. So the purpose of me gathering the, this group, this work group and this focus group initially was to really, really address this in Albemarle County. And you know how can we enhance and streamline services to our community members and those in crisis? Um, how can we reduce impact on local hospitals? Is the emergency room the right place for that? Is that taking up a bed space or a spot for somebody that's having another, a different type of medical emergency? And most importantly, it's about criminal justice reform. We talked about you know how uh, the bed space and how much space uh, you know and the, the costs associated with housing. Uh, people in crisis and whether or not that's the right place, which is not the jail is not the correct atmosphere environment for somebody that's undergoing mental health crisis to be housed. And not only that, but you know, with our officers um, being put in situations where they're um, unintentionally uh, escalating situations. And there, there's a case say there's example after example across the country of officers handling mental health calls for service inappropriately and using excessive force. And that in turn ends up costing people their jobs, costing uh, municipalities, um, you know, money and lawsuits and civil litigation, as well as public imaging as well, uh, the, the public image as well. So we talk about de-escalation and we talk about alternative support in jail, reducing civil liability. And this last um, bullet is legal compliance with, you know, the governor's signing into the Marcus Alert. And up here are some of the partners I've reached out and worked with, with our crisis intervention team, with uh, Region 10, with the Almar County Department of Social Services, with uh, ECC, with Almar County Fire Rescue, with our Sheriff's Department, and with also our, our County Attorney, our Commonwealth Attorney's Office, as well as the County Executive Office are part of this work group. So, you know, our, we meet once a month, this work group does, we meet once a month and we talk about what could be which lined up coincidentally, we started these conversations in October and then in November, Governor Northam signed into law the Marcus Alert, which will um, establish a statewide mental health awareness response. The measure also promotes a behavioral health response to individuals in crisis and limits the role of law enforcement. This law is named after a 23 year old man who was shot and killed by Richmond police officer in May of 2018 while experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, this current law, the Marcus Alert, has some time frames in it. Um, it has some requirements from DCHS and law enforcement agency roles engagement with the Marcus Alert system, um, as well as uh, introducing a volunteer database made available to 911 and Marcus Alert to provide mental health emergency contact information for emergency responders. That benchmark date is due by 2021, and that's going to be driven by conversations by DCGS. Right now, there's no clarity from the, the governor's office on DCGS on what that looks like as far as what law enforcement's role is going to be um, at this time, time frame. On December uh, 1st, there's gonna be five Marcus Alert programs and community care or these mobile crisis uh, response teams that are gonna be piloted through the Commonwealth. Um, these five jurisdictions have already been identified. Um, our area is not one of them. Uh, July 1st by 2022, and this is the one, this is the first real benchmark that we're, we're, we're really paying attention to because this is going to have an impact when we talk about diversion of 911 calls to crisis care centers. That's going to impact our ECC. And um, if, if, if done successfully, if implemented successfully, uh, these 911 call centers will alleviate and, and mitigate the, uh, the amount of response that law enforcement has to these calls for service. And other states that have successful diversion center programs, 911 calls, what that looks like, somebody's undergoing certain types of crisis, they call 911, there's a screening process, and they get diverted to a crisis call center. That has alleviated up to 90% of calls for service when it comes to, uh, in certain states, um, not having the need for law enforcement to respond. 
Um, in July of 2023, there's five additional Marcus Alert programs, community uh, care mobile crisis teams will be implemented and piloted. Um, those have not been identified. And then by 2026, there's gonna be a statewide implement implementation of the Marcus Alert program and um, mobile crisis response teams. Um, that is the goal. Um, there's a lot of work that's currently being done. Um, there's uh, a lot of things that are not defined on what these uh, what these programs are going to look like and what these mobile crisis teams are going to look like. So there's a lot of behind the scenes conversations uh, going on, and our work group is is paying attention to this and driving on with a framework of what what we can do at the local level as long as it aligns with with the um, the Marcus Alert. Um, what you're looking at now is a loose flow chart of what it could look like. As far as a person in crisis, they'll call ECC, they'll call 911, and they'll be referred either settled by phone, here's the 90% where it's settled by phone, it's cut off on the bottom screen, and there's a follow-up phone call done by the crisis line with these individuals to make sure they're doing okay. For the other 10% of the calls for service, um, they are referred to a mobile crisis team. A mobile crisis team will um, uh, attend to their needs. Either there's some sort of stabilization, which means they need to go to the hospital or some sort of facility, or they talk to them and no further actions needed. Um, again, what you're seeing in this chart is very limited law enforcement response. On a local level, um, what it would potentially look like is um, the crisis response team in a perfect world would be a mental health worker or somebody from social services, or if we were to stand up a department within Almar County, a health and human services department that would specialize in substance abuse, mental health, and other quality of life issues that, that don't necessarily meet the criteria for law enforcement. Um, law enforcement would be removed and then somebody from rescue. And this, this is why fire rescue is at the table. So that's what that crisis response team could look like with law enforcement taking a support role, meaning if there's a situation where somebody is combative or has a weapon and it's fact-based, we law enforcement would go render the scene safe and then turn it back over to the crisis response team for follow-up and for care. So as you can see, now the, the responsibility is shifted from law enforcement back to a team that's better suited to handling these types of crises. And then give you a brief overview of who um, is on the crisis response team. Um, this work group, as we're talking about, Almaro County, we have Tom Van Hammerit, myself, uh, Sheriff Bryant, Mary Sevens from Social Services, Lori Wood from Region 10, Amanda Farley from County Legal, uh, Deputy Chief David Puckett from Fire Rescue, um, Jim Hengley from the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, Sonny Saxon for ECC. And then later on, we're going to include internal representatives from our crisis intervention team, as well as the magistrate's office alternative transportation services. And then um, we're, we would probably open this up for conversation on a broader scale, meaning you know UVA and Charlottesville um, at a later date till we can really wrap our minds around this. You know, and then finally, this is my last slide, Richard, as far as the next steps um, and you know, what we can do is, you know, the purpose of this very compressed, uh, this very heavy subject and very, um, important subject that doesn't get a lot of attention, but um, I just wanted to thank you all for, for taking the time out of your busy days and allowing me to raise awareness of this mental health issue within the Almaro County area um, and just ask for your support of our Region 10 partners and, um, and support any type of reform, uh, especially you know, criminal justice reform that decouples law enforcement from medical calls for service. And that's what's at the heart of this. And um, just be aware that there is a work group um, that we're going to begin our strategic planning conversations this February, this month, later on when we meet, and then uh, potentially explore the need for a health and human services department within Almaro County, whether that's an individual department or falls under DSS. But I open that up for, for thought and conversation, and we certainly don't have to address that now, but I, I offer that up for, uh, for food for thought. And with that, that is my, my last slide, and I will end uh, my presentation opened up for questions and answers with the last few minutes that we have. Yes, Sean, uh, thank you so much. An absolutely outstanding presentation. And uh, I feel comfortable in saying that uh, we'll have you back. And this is much larger subject uh, as we move forward as a committee. Uh, so briefly, questions, uh, Brent? So yes, a couple things. Um, I think it's great that they're working towards that uh, it's kind of the same situation that the fire department runs into when 
uh, an elderly person just needs help from their house to the car. And so they, you know, EMS responds to that and they need a different avenue of being able to help those people. Um, but the question I have is, is, so who do you see that's normally calling in for the response? Is it the person in crisis or the people around them? It would be, um, it's a combination of all, it, it, there's a third, there, there's a third branch in there as well. It would be the people that are in crisis that will call 911 that says, hey, I've taken pills or I'm, you know, I slipped my wrist or I'm depressed. And I'm thinking about killing myself. Then you'll have the family members that say, hey, my loved one is acting off or, hey, they went in their room or they've overdosed on pills. They're unconscious. Or sometimes they'll go to the magistrate's office and obtain what's an ECO emergency custody order. Um, and we'll get those from the magistrate's office where we have to respond and serve that paperwork on the person in crisis. Um, and law enforcement will respond. And um, your question also, uh, John, something else, uh, Mr. Hall, that, um, that we, we also get calls from assisted living facilities. And uh, it's deeply disturbing that, um, that several, that, that you have patients that are in assisted living facilities that, that have been clinically diagnosed with a condition like dementia. And yet you're sending law enforcement to a assisted uh, care facility to handle somebody that's in their 80s and 90s, it's just not a good look. It's not a position that our officers should be in. That is a medical function. They've been medically diagnosed, yet to this day, we still get those types of calls for service. And that's that's the business that we need to remove ourselves from. So thank you for the question. Yeah, thank right. you for the presentation. All right, Brian, do you have uh, a question for uh, Deputy Chief? Yes, just a quick one. Uh, when we think about the information that you share, first of all, thank you. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, it's much needed. But the opportunity for CIT training to go beyond those within the first responder community to the broader community, because oftentimes we are the ones who are making those calls for service, but we're making it based upon our understanding of what we think we're seeing when we oftentimes aren't seeing that. We're just seeing people in crisis. What are your thoughts about opening it up to residents from across the county to kind of be a, a part of this training so they could best uh, evaluate what's going on. And when they make a call, they could say, I think this person is in crisis, much more mental instead of criminal. Uh, because again, that might kind of set you guys up for something um, that's a bad look, as you said. Yes, uh, and that's, Mr. Wood, that's an excellent um, question. What I'll do is um, I meet with Lori Wood from Region 10 and Tom Van Hammer every month ahead of our meeting and I will take that ask to them and I will circle back with you to let you know and I'll share that that idea um, whether it's a week-long class or a community open community clinic that teaches some of the CID fundamentals uh, to raise awareness to that but I'll certainly take it back to the trainers and ask. Uh, thank you Deputy Chief. Um, John do you have a question for the Deputy Chief? Well I guess a statement uh, first of all uh, Sean it's a great presentation. Uh, Thanks, sir. Uh, great work bringing everybody together too. Uh, I guess one of the things that runs through my mind is as you start to develop uh, uh, your, uh, your next step, uh, setting up a series of objectives that you want to accomplish at each, at each step along the way that are kind of criteria oriented, it seems to me would be helpful to the group. Uh, in order to get a little bit of an idea of whether you're, uh, you're, you're actually moving along a path where you're, you're getting toward what you're looking to accomplish. But yes. thank you very much. Great work. Uh, thank you for the feedback and advice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Olga, do you have a question for uh, Deputy Chief? And first of all, thank you for joining us. A little bit hey, late. good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I definitely have a question. I mean, uh, you know, I, I used to work for the Boys and Girls Clubs, as you guys know, and a uh, ton of uh, health needs there. And, um, you know, there's definitely the stigma uh, with police officers coming in to deal with something that, you know, I, I absolutely on board. I don't think it's their job, you know, and it, it can make things worse. I mean, I'm thinking if a staff member that doesn't know what they're doing can make things worse, imagine somebody in a uniform. Um, it, what are some tangible items that we as a group or individually can do to help and support 
um, you know, this work group uh, that you guys are, are doing? You know, what can we do um, on our end, you know, with this committee that we are in uh, to support you? That's, that's my main question. I know we're almost out of time, but that's my main question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at, this, at this point in our venture, I would say support and awareness of of these efforts in really getting behind um, the idea to decriminalize the medical policy service and, and look for opportunities where they're supporting legislation or uh, working with local politicians or activists um, in the mental health field to say, how can we partner with law enforcement to um, give community members the service they need and, and, and break away from you know, feeding people into the criminal justice system that, that should be getting mental health services and getting better. So support at this point in time, support and awareness of the topic are, are the two primary things at this at this point in time. Okay, great. Um, I'm part of a Rotary Club. I'd love for you to come speak uh, to that group. Uh, so I'll be in touch, see yeah. if, uh, you know, raise that awareness. We have about 80 members that are, half of them are very big in the community. So that may be a good audience to, to make aware of all of this. Uh, Chief Lance has been there numerous times. So that'd be great. Thank you for the invitation, appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Olga, for that. Uh, Diantha, you have anything brief for the Deputy Chief? I have a lot and I'm not sure I can be brief. So I will try to ask my, a lot of my questions offline with Ron, but first of all, Ron, or, and Sean, thank you for the great presentation. Is it possible for you to send the presentation out to the board members so we have a copy of it? I'd like to have some of that information. Yes, and, absolutely. Um, I will say that just from my 24 years of experience, as the General Assembly um, mainstreamed people with mental health issues, just as they mainstreamed children with special needs, they didn't provide the funding for the communities to deal with with these problems. And so this, this is been building for decades. Having said that, Ron, are we gonna be seeing this as a part of a budget, our upcoming budget? Because it looks like to me that this means <laughs> positions or help from the supervisors. I am extraordinarily excited and pleased to see this presentation and this information. So it, we'll see more in the budget cycle. Yeah, absolutely. As Sean and the team work it out, that's where they're going to try to build out what positions we need for the response. You know, one of the biggest things, Sean hit it a couple times, was that health and human services component um, out of maybe potentially DSS. I know a lot of jurisdictions have that. So that's a potential, Diana, for additional positions um, right there. Years out, I know we're quick on time, but years out, I personally would like to have just a CIT full-time response team myself that does triage, not when people are in crisis, but when they're having a good day. Yeah. Check on them, see how they're doing. To make calls in the future. That's my goal uh, going down the road. Well, and I just want to make a statement on behalf of Albemarle County. Um, the During these challenging times, the uh, departments that we have been willing to and have given additional support and money to are social services, fire and rescue, police, all of those um, uh, departments that, that are critical to our community's health and safety. So just to keep that in mind, um, I look forward to those discussions. One other quick thing, and I'm sorry, I know we're short on time. The, there's one group that I see missing from this discussion. We have a local mental health, it used to be the Mental Health Association, it's now Mental Health America. And I know Anna Mendez is their director. She's listening to this discussion and Kate Acuff is on their board is I would just want to make sure that they're included in some of this, these, this work, Ron. So, um, and I'll just leave that at, at that. Um, oh, and one more quick thing. President, former President Obama's 21st century policing, that was the beginning of the geopolicing, what we followed throughout and has served us so well. Uh, many communities threw it out. Are there components of this in that 21st century policing? I have a copy of it somewhere. Maybe I'll go dig it out, Ron, but I was just wondering. Well, we have maintained the uh, 21st. Oh, I know, I know that. But I was trying to figure out, Richard, to be honest with you, if there are, if there's a component in those recommendations in the 21st policing uh, model that get to this mental health piece. Ron? Not me, I don't know, I was just wondering. Can sure. you answer that, 
Sure. I have not looked at that in a while, Diane. I, I like you would have to go back and review it and see if there are. That's a great question. Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll I might face with you this week and, and get back to you. Yeah, it would be good to look and see if there are recommendations in that document because it was a really good um, uh, document for policing. And with that, I'm sorry I took so much time. All right, thank you, Diantha. Donna, you're the last, and then we have to close. You have something brief. Very brief. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chief Reeves. Um, as with Supervisor McKeel, I have a lot of questions, and I'm really looking forward to seeing some information come in the budget request. The only question I'd ask right now though is recognizing that Albemarle County was not chosen as one of the five primary population areas for the first wicket. Looking at the July 1st, 2023 additional five, have we projected or forecast whether we anticipate we would be one of those five population regions to go to the next step? Yeah, that's a question that, that I posed to uh, Lori Wood from Region 10 and um, how jurisdictions are selected is based on uh, need and calls for service. And right now, while Albemarle has in our region, which is Albemarle and several other surrounding jurisdictions, um, do have a high number. We are not the highest in the Commonwealth. Um, several of those are reserved for the, the denser populated areas of Northern Virginia and the coastal, uh, the, the, the tidewater. Area. So um, we, we, we could certainly ask and say, hey, keep in mind, and we're, what this work group is doing is ahead of the curve, what other jurisdictions are doing right now that, that, that um, aren't really paying as close attention as we are. So it's about trying to position ourselves where we can have these higher level conversations, say, hey, we're, we're doing work on this. Could we be considered for this pilot um, you know, in this next go around? Well, yeah, that's the basic. We're not one of the top five, but are we currently projected to be six through 10? Because if so, then we need to start looking forward to July 1st, 2023. Yes. yes. Oh, and I'd like to... Uh... I'd like to thank all the members and, of course, our visiting supervisor and Diantha. And our next meeting is April 13th. And with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And we have a second. A second. All right, then. Thank you, for everybody. And we'll see each other again on April 13th. And I'm sure we're going to have continued discussions with this uh, uh, Deputy Chief Reeves. This is an enormous topic and something of great interest to this, commi to this committee. And with that, I say uh, have a nice morning. Have a Outstanding day. meeting. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye everybody. <laughs>